Chapter 14 of Benito Sereno. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Benito Sereno by Herman Melville. Conclusion. If the deposition of Benito Sereno has served as the key to fit into the lock of the complications which preceded it, then, as a vault whose door has been flung back, the San Dominic's hull lies open today. Hitherto the nature of this narrative, besides rendering the intricacies in the beginning unavoidable, has more or less required that many things, instead of being set down in the order of occurrence, should be retrospectively or irregularly given. This last is the case with the following passages, which will conclude the account. During the long, mild voyage to Lima, there was, as before hinted, a period during which Don Benito a little recovered his health, or, at least in some degree, his tranquillity. Ere the decided relapse which came, the two captains had many cordial conversations, their fraternal unreserve in singular contrast with former withdrawments. Again and again it was repeated how hard it had been to enact the part forced on the Spaniard by Babo. Ah, my dear Don Amasa, Don Benito once said, at those very times when you thought me so morose and ungrateful, nay, when, as you now admit, you half thought me plotting your murder, at those very times my heart was frozen. I could not look at you, thinking of what, both on board this ship and your own, hung from other hands over my kind benefactor. And, as God lives, Don Amasa, I know not whether desire for my own safety alone could have nerved me to that leap into your boat, had it not been for the thought that, did you, unenlightened, return to your ship, you, my best friend, with all who might be with you, stolen upon that night, in your hammocks, would never in this world have wakened again. Do but think how you walked this deck, how you sat in this cabin, every inch of ground mined into honeycombs under you. Had I dropped the least hint, made the least advance toward an understanding between us, death, explosive death, yours and mine, would have ended the scene. True, true, cried Captain Delano, starting. You saved my life, Don Benito, more than I yours, saved it, too, against my knowledge and will. Nay, my friend, rejoined the Spaniard, courteous even to the point of religion, God charmed your life, but you saved mine. To think of some things you did, those smilings and chattings, rash pointings and gesturings. For less than these, they slew my mate, Raynids. But you had the Prince of Heaven's safe conduct through all ambuscades. Yes, all is owing to Providence, I know. But the temper of my mind that morning was more than commonly pleasant, while the sight of so much suffering, more apparent than real, added to my good nature, compassion, and charity, happily interweaving the three. Had it been otherwise, doubtless, as you hint, some of my interferences with the blacks might have ended unhappily enough. Besides that, those feelings I spoke of enabled me to get the better of momentary distrust at times when acuteness might have cost me my life without saving another's. Only at the end did my suspicions get the better of me, and you know how wide of the mark they then proved. Wide indeed, said Don Benito sadly. You were with me all day, stood with me, sat with me, talked with me, looked at me, ate with me, drank with me, and yet your last act was to clutch for a villain, not only an innocent man, but the most pitiable of all men. To such degree may malign machinations and deceptions impose. So far may even the best men err in judging the conduct of one with the recesses of whose condition he is not acquainted. But you were forced to it, and you were in time undeceived. Would that in both respects it was so ever, and with all men. 
I think I understand you. You generalized on Benito, and mournfully enough. But the past is past. Why moralize upon it? Forget it. See, yon bright sun has forgotten it all, and the blue sea and the blue sky. These have turned over new leaves. Because they have no memory, he dejectedly replied, because they are not human. But these mild trades that now fan your cheek, Don Benito, do they not come with a human-like healing to you? Warm friends, steadfast friends, are the trades. With their steadfastness they but waft me to my tomb, senor, was the foreboding response. You are saved, Don Benito, cried Captain Delano, more and more astonished and pained. You are saved. What has cast such a shadow upon you? The Negro. There was silence, while the moody man sat slowly and unconsciously gathering his mantle about him as if it were a pall. There was no more conversation that day. But if the Spaniard's melancholy sometimes ended in mutinous upon topics like the above, there were others upon which he never spoke at all, on which, indeed, all his old reserves were piled. Pass over the worst, and only to elucidate, let an item or two of these be cited. The dress so precise and costly, worn by him on the day whose events have been narrated, had not willingly been put on, and that silver-mounted sword, apparent symbol of despotic command, was not, indeed, a sword, but the ghost of one. The scabbard, artificially stiffened, was empty. As for the black, whose brain, not body, had schemed and led the revolt with the plot, his slight frame inadequate to that which it held, had at once yielded to the superior muscular strength of his captor in the boat. Seeing all was over, he uttered no sound and could not be forced to. His aspect seemed to say, Since I cannot do deeds, I will not speak words. Put in irons in the hold, with the rest, he was carried to Lima. During the passage, Don Benito did not visit him, nor then, nor at any time after, would he look at him. Before the tribunal, he refused. When pressed by the judges, he fainted. On the testimony of the sailors alone rested the legal identity of Babo. And yet the Spaniard would, upon occasion, verbally refer to the Negro, as has been shown. But look on him he would not, or could not. Some months after, dragged to the gibbet at the tail of a mule, the black met his voiceless end. The body was burned to ashes, but for many days the head, that hive of subtlety, fixed on a pole in the plaza, met unabashed the gaze of the whites, and across the plaza looked toward St. Bartholomew's church, in whose vaults slept then, as now, the recovered bones of Aranda and across the Rimac Bridge looked toward the monastery on Mount Agonia without, where, three months after being dismissed by the court, Benito Sereno, born on the bier, did indeed follow his leader. The End End of Chapter 14 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista End of Benito Sereno by Herman Melville